which heaven joys o bright and sun, heart of my heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler. Of Hello, welcome back to our study of how to interpret the Bible. You'll remember in the last two class sessions, we were looking at the words and how important it is to consider the words as we're looking at a particular scripture if we really want to fully understand it. We noticed that several words are used in different ways and that really only the context reveals the meaning of those words to us. So we've got to carefully read the surrounding verses and the verse itself to understand what's going on. Toward the close of the last lesson, we began giving some uh, ideas of things that will help us to see the meaning of words within a particular context. For example, we talked about the meaning of the word when it was written. Uh, that's very important because words do change over time. What something meant some years ago may not be what it means today. And so consider the meaning when it was written. Also, remember that the author may give the meaning. He may tip us off uh, by either defining the word specifically or making it synonymous with other words so that we can understand what he's talking about. An example that we used of that was the word elders, which we saw was used synonymously with the words bishop and the word pastors. And so knowing that the elders, the bishops, and the pastors are all the same person, or group of people helps us to appreciate the fact more than just an older man, it means instead an office within the church. We then recognize the fact that words describing particular actions always should be taken literally. If the text said jump or run or stand or narrowly, it would mean it, it would be specific in what it was doing. You can't follow the command to run to the chariot, as uh, Philip was instructed in Acts chapter 8, by walking. Instead, the command is very, very specific and therefore must be taken literally. But now we want to observe a few more rules before we go forward any further with our understanding of the text. And that is that the context may give us the meaning of a particular word. Take, for example, in John chapter 8, verse 47, where the word here is used. We want to see how the Lord used that word on that occasion. John chapter 8, uh, verse 47. And let's listen to what is written there. He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore you do not hear because you are not of God. Now, wait a minute. Does that mean they're deaf? Well, all of us in reading that context can realize, no, that's, that's not what it's talking about. Instead, the word here, instead of being a literal, where one is receiving the sound, actually is, is describing something else. Clearly, here it means to heed, to pay attention to. Not just to hear the sound, but then to act upon the sound, to do whatever the Lord commands. The Jews didn't really hear God. How did Jesus know? Because they didn't do what God said. They didn't heed His words. Similarly, we find a word in Romans chapter 2, verse 13. In Romans 2... Uh, the Apostle Paul writing to those Christians at Rome, whom he's not gotten to see as yet, uh, makes an interesting statement. Let's see what he said. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Now in this case, he is talking about hearing the sound. It's not enough to just know what God said. I've got to make it active in my life. And so Paul transitions to the word doers. Do what you hear God say. The word simple 
in Romans chapter 16 is another one of those words that we need to understand. Look at Romans chapter 16 and begin at verse 17. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Now, what does he mean by simple there? Uh, that, that's a, an interesting word. Is he describing someone who, who is not very far advanced uh, intellectually? Someone that has struggled with advancing? Is that what he's talking about? I don't think so. Instead, read on in the next verse. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I'm glad on your behalf. But I want you to be wise in what is good concerning evil. Obviously, Paul wanted the brethren to be wise in what is good. But then, in other words, through experience, I want you to do what is good. And that's how I want you to become known as being wise. Now, the opposite of this would be inexperienced. And Paul says, I want you to be simple concerning evil. I want you to be inexperienced concerning evil. Now go back and think about deceiving the hearts of the simple. Newborn babes in Christ, people just converted by the gospel, may not be fully conversant with all the teachings of Christ. They're simple not because they're not intellectually capable of understanding, but instead they're simple because they've not yet had enough experience. Be careful because there are some people out there who will deceive the simple, the uneducated, those who have not yet grown in knowledge. And we want to be careful to mark those people, keep them away from young Christians. Then the last thing we want to observe before we go on from this idea of the words is to consider the rules of grammar. Being acquainted with the rules of grammar can help us in our understanding. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth about partaking of the Lord's Supper. In the King James Version, we have an interesting wording that is found and one that has confused a number of people. Let's look at that. <clears throat> In King James Version, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 27 has this reading. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now, when some people read this, they think, well, I'm not worthy of the death of Christ, and so I can't partake of the Lord's Supper. But there is a rule of grammar that would help all of us to understand what this meaning is in the King James Version. And the rule of grammar is uh, that, that the word worthily is an adverb. It doesn't modify the noun, that would be me or you, as we partake the Lord's Supper. Instead, it modifies the verb, partake. It's the partaking that is unworthy. In other words, I can participate in the Lord's Supper in a way that would be deemed unworthy by God because my actions are not guided in the way that they need to be guided. The apostle was warning the Corinthian brethren against unworthily partaking an action which comes uh, by thoughtless hurrying through the Lord's Supper and failing to remember or to consider the death of our Lord. So considering the words is very, very important to our understanding of Scripture. If we want to interpret the Bible correctly, we've got to learn to look at the words. Now having said that, a part of looking at the words, you'll remember, was to take things literally at first until you must take them some other way. 
until the meaning in the context demands otherwise. So now we want to begin to look at figurative language. And there are many figures of speech in the Bible. Now you might say, wait a minute, I'm a straightforward person. I don't use liter uh, uh, figurative language. I'm only literal when I speak. <laughs> I would laugh and say, really? I don't know you very well, but let's imagine some things that you might say. <clears throat> you might, for example, say, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Should I take that literally? Of course not. You don't mean that literally you're, you could eat a horse. Oh, the animal, first of all, is huge. It's way too big. Secondly, you may not even eat horse. I know I don't, or at least not knowingly I don't. And so what's going on here? Well, what I'm saying is my hunger is so great that I could eat a giant animal like a horse. That's a figure of speech. Uh, my wife, on one occasion, teaching four-year-olds in four-year-old kindergarten, uh, said to one little boy who kept getting into trouble, young man, if you don't straighten up, you're going to be in hot water. She said his eyes got huge. And you can just imagine what a four-year-old thought. He could just about see my wife with a giant pot of water, putting it up on top of the stove and turning it on high. And when the water got good and hot, then dipping him in it. <laughs> well, obviously that's not what she meant. What she was saying is, I'm using a figure of speech to say, you're going to be in a lot of trouble if you don't quit doing that. So we use figurative language all the time in our communication. So we use it without, really without second thought. Someone says, well, she's as pretty as a picture. Really? I'd say she's prettier than a picture uh, because she's more beautiful than the picture is. But... You know, pictures do capture an amount of beauty, and so it's a good comparison. Someone else will say, I'm caught between a rock and a hard place. We don't look at them and say, well, where's the rock and where's the hard place? Instead, we understand what they mean is, I've got a difficult choice that's got to be made. Somebody else will say, my cup is running over. And we might look and say, well, you're, no, your cup's not running over. In fact, it's, it's just half full. Uh, no, we wouldn't do that. We understand what they mean is I'm being bountifully blessed. So we use figurative language all the time. A child may take it literally, but we adults have learned not to take it literally. Now, we must give careful consideration to the Word of God to realize that when God communicated with man, that He knew the man used figurative language. And so God used figurative language as well. For instance, in the Bible we will find similes. A simile <clears throat> is an explicit comparison using either the words like or the word as. Let's see if we can give an example of that. In Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, the singer of Israel said, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. He says, what? He shall be like a tree? Is the singer of Israel saying that a, that a person who loves the word of God is a tree? No. He's saying like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Now, really, in the eastern part of the United States, that's difficult to understand. Because there's so many beautiful trees. Water is so plentiful. But if you go out in the western part of the United States, you'll discover something quite different. Sometimes rolling out through uh, the desert country, you'll see in the distance, a, at first what appears to be just a, a green ribbon that runs across the countryside. And if you're new to the area, you may wonder, what, what is that? 
What's, what is that up ahead? Well, miles and miles later, you'll discover it's a river that goes through there. And that river, because it is present, provides plenty of water for giant trees to grow. The same is true in the land of Israel, where they have a more arid type of climate. Where do the big trees grow in Israel? The answer is they grow by the water. So the person who delights in the Word of God, in the law of God, that person can literally be described as being like a tree growing by the water. They're going to be big and strong. They're always going to produce fruit when they're supposed to. That is a simile. Another simile is found in Luke chapter 10, verse 3. When Jesus, talking to the disciples as He's sending them out on the limited commission, says to them, Beloved, I send you as lambs among wolves. Now Jesus is not saying that His disciples are all lambs. He's not saying that false teachers are all wolves. But He's saying, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. And sheep among wolves have to be careful lest they be destroyed by the wolves. Similarly, as the disciples went forth, they had to be careful because they were going to be surrounded by enemies, as it were. Another simile that is used in Scripture is found in Matthew chapter 25, in verse 32, where Jesus is telling the parable of the judgment day. And there He says, He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Now watch that. As a shepherd divides. It's not going to be a shepherd dividing, but it'll be like that. It can be compared to that, for that is what it will be like. In Genesis 22, verse 17, we find yet another simile, where the writer Moses reports about Abraham that God said to him, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. Notice, I'm going to multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. Does he mean that Abraham's going to give birth, Abraham and Sarah are going to give birth to a lot of stars? (laughs) No. What he means is that just like there are so many stars in the sky, Abraham and Sarah are going to have that many descendants. And just like there is so much sand on the seashore, so many different grains of sand, in just the same way Abraham's children, Sarah's children, will grow up to be like the innumerable grains of sand on the seashore. Thus, the Bible uses similes. But it also uses metaphors. A metaphor is a comparison that is made by direct assertion in which one thing is described in terms of another. Now everybody turn together with me to the book of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 1, Jeremiah is describing his call by God. And as he describes that call, God uses some words that at first may surprise us until we look a little bit more deeply. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 18. For behold, I have made you this day a fortified city and an iron pillar. Now, Jeremiah was a man, just like you and I are human beings. God saying to him, today I've made you a fortified city. I'm not a man anymore. I'm a city. He says, well, I've made you an iron pillar. Really? I I feel like I'm still a man. You you say I'm an iron pillar? No. Obviously, God is using these two very powerful, strong, well-defensible items, objects, to describe how that God is going to strengthen Jeremiah even in the face of great adversity. So, a metaphor. We are very familiar with at least one metaphor in Scripture. It's found in Psalm chapter 23, when in verse 1, David, the singer of Israel, says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
Well, obviously, David didn't think of himself as a sheep, nor did he really think of the Lord as a shepherd. But he was comparing the two, and it was a great comparison. God is a, God's son is a loving shepherd. God is a loving shepherd who guides his people just like a shepherd guides his sheep. Jesus used a metaphor uh, <clears throat> in uh, the institution of the Lord's Supper. When in Matthew chapter 26, verse 26, he said, Take, eat, this is my body. Now, this is my body? Really? Think about it a moment. Jesus was bodily present when he made that statement. Now, you know the disciples, in looking at that bread, did not think that that bread was literally the body of Jesus. No, they saw his literal body. It was right there. Instead, he was saying, this bread is representative of my body. When you eat it, think about my body, which was broken for you. Think about the sacrifice that I made in your behalf. That is the metaphor that Jesus had in mind. A third figure of speech that we want to look at is the figure called metonymy. Now, several of us might think, oh, wait a minute, preacher, we don't, we don't use those, that kind of language around here. Well, actually we do. The word metonymy uh, describes some, uh, an incident where two things are so closely associated that to say one makes you think of the other or it brings the other to our minds. Let me give you an example. If tonight, when I get home, my wife were to say to me, uh, could you bring me a glass from the kitchen? I would assume she doesn't just want the glass. What's she going to do with a glass sitting in the living room if the glass is empty? Now, there might be a use, but more than likely what she's really saying is, could you bring me a drink? And so I would get ice in the glass and water in the glass, and then I would take it to her. Why does she say, bring me a glass? Because the glass and the drink are so closely associated that you can say one and you think of the other. That's metonymy. Uh, teachers use this kind of language all the time. I want you to think for just a moment about a field trip made with children. Uh, the teacher gets all the children up into the bus, gets all the chaperones up into the bus. And then before she even lets them close the door, she says, okay, let's count heads. Are they only taking heads? Why, of course not. You understand that. I understand that. When she says, let's count heads, she's saying, let's count all the people who are here. Truth is, if you think about it for just a moment, if someone mentions a name, what's the first image you see? Isn't it their head, more particularly their face, that comes into your mind's eye? Well, sure it is. So we use metonymy all the time. It's very common. It's not just common with us. It can also be found within Scripture. When Jesus, in instituting the Lord's Supper, said, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you, it is obvious that he is not speaking about the cup itself. Instead, he is speaking about the contents of the cup. If, you, if someone said to you, now, drink all your cup, you wouldn't think, well, how am I going to do that? I'm going to turn this cup into liquid in order to swallow? Of course not. Obviously, what they're saying is, drink everything that's in your cup. So Jesus was saying that this fruit of the vine is representative of the blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary. That is metonymy. Another case of metonymy is found in Luke chapter 19 in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. When Abraham told the rich man, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. What was he referring to? Moses and the prophets were long since dead by the time that Jesus walked on the earth. 
And so when he said they have Moses and the prophets, what he must have meant, what he surely means, is they have the writings of Moses and the prophets. And the writings of Moses and the prophets are clear means of causing people on earth to live the way God wants them to live so that they will not have to go in death to the place of torments. That's what Jesus meant. He was using metonymy. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 17, verse 6, we find another use of metonymy. And this is a case where we, we adults probably read it and understand it without even giving it a second thought. But we may need to help our children understand it. Look at what is said there. Deuteronomy 17, 6. Whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He shall not be put to death on the testimony of one witness. Now, in the old King James, it doesn't say testimony. It says, at the mouth of. Now, obviously, as this translation gets it, he's not talking about there are two or three mouths that come up and, and put themselves on this person and therefore they die. No. He's talking about the words that come out of the mouth. It is metonymy. And so we've begun to think about the words that are used in Scripture. We're talking about various words, and as we look at them, we realize some of them are figurative. There are similes in Scripture where the words like or as are used to compare two things so that we can understand what's being spoken of. There are, after all, metaphors in Scripture where no like or as appears, but there's a comparison made uh, that is made with explicit words or the specific words. And then there's metonymy. Metonymy, where two things are so closely related that you can say one and think the other. We'll see more about those kinds of things, figurative language, in our next study together. I want to urge you, don't fail to be a part of this study as we learn how better to interpret the Word of God.